All right. Hello, everyone. So we got a bunch of folks in the chat. I'm going to zoom in a little so I can see it here. Hope you're all doing well. I hope you can hear me and see me clear enough. It's been a while since I did one of these. Still working on the new system. All right. We got James, Chip, Mickey, Wandering128, Jim, Crazy Melvis, Stefan Pelican, Crazy uh, Dan. Good to see you all here. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, Crazy Melvin says, who here has seen Chris Thiele? I have seen Chris Thiele a couple times, and it's always a treat to see him. I haven't seen him live in years, but he's awesome. Uh, let me know if everything's coming through loud and clear, both visually and auditorily. It seems like it is, but I never know. And yeah, uh, if you're new here, I see some new names, which is great. Uh, I've been doing these less frequently, so I see I see new names every time, which is very exciting. Um, if these are if you're new here, uh, the way these work is pretty uh, pretty low key, just kind of doing some playing some tunes. I'm happy to answer questions. So if you got questions, throw them out there, and I'll do my best to answer them. No question too simple. No question too complex. Uh, it's all fair game, and I'm happy to dive into it. Um, I'll take requests as long as they are traditional, non-copyrighted fiddle tunes. Uh, the first tune that I played there was a tune, the, actually the tune that just came out today. Um, it's uh, Fine Times at Our House. I had my buddy Noah Fishman uh, teach it. Uh, he, we put out an album called Fine Times, and we play that tune on the album, so I figured it'd be fun to have a little guest slot. Have him teach fine times. And then I played Little Billy Wilson, a great, uh, another great old time tune in the key of A. It's a hot day here in Oregon. Gonna get close to 90, so good day for iced coffee. Chip says Methodist Preacher. I don't know that one off the top of my head. James has a great question. What's the difference between a jig and a slip jig? So a jig. Uh, is six eight so one two three four five six one two three four five six and a slip jig is nine eight so it's three four five six seven eight nine one two three four five six seven eight nine so you can think of it as sometimes jigs are called double jigs um and then you have slip jigs are just kind of Three little chunks of three. You can think of a jig, a regular jig, as two chunks of three. Um, Whereas a slip jig is a. Uh... <laughs> I like that. James says try. A slip jig is a try not to slip into a normal jig jig. Um, a good example of a slip jig is uh, the Canavan Bana or the Fair Haired Canavans. Uh, great Irish. I don't know if it's on my website, but. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Well, that's hard to do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's it's nine. You're kind you're kind of the groups of nine. Let's zoom in a little bit here. Uh, doesn't need to be that far away. There's some cool tunes. Um, a great tune by this uh, by a guy from. Uh, Way Eastern Canada, Elmer Deagle has a great tune called Faith Aaliyah, and uh, it's half slip jig and half jig. Uh, this is jig. This is still normal jig, A2. Here's the slip jig.
So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, et cetera. So that's a tune that's got a little of both. All right, we got Matt from Texas and Elise from Sonoma. Good to have you here. Crazy Melvis says, my grandfather was taught by Jethro Burns. Cool. I would love to have taken lessons from Jethro. Who, uh, and Jethro said the mandolin he made was the best mandolin he ever played. Who was your grandfather? And what was his mandolin? Inquiring what minds want to know. Uh, Robert says, wish I knew when you were going to go live. Just happened to catch you. Cool. Yeah, it was a little kind of last minute. Things are a little less uh, normal around here and probably lots of places. So I, I can't do a whole lot of scheduling at this point, but hopefully uh, I'll get back to a regular schedule at some point. Yeah, I want to know what that mandolin is, Crazy Melvis. Uh, Mark Reich, he made the mandolin in the 70s. Cool, I haven't, I haven't heard of him. It's great that, you know, there's always this, I spend a lot of time thinking about mandolins and looking at mandolins, and there's always more that I've never heard of popping out. Ben, good to have you here. Thanks for joining in. <laughs> David says, mandolin sounds a bit tinny. Sound problem? Potentially. Uh, I'm not set up. I usually have more fancy mics, but uh, my live streaming setup is a little bit compromised. But it also could just be the fact that the mandolin is a tinny instrument. <laughs> but uh, I hope it's at least palatable enough to stick around. Cool. Jackson says, just dropping in to say love your content. Really appreciate all the time. Uh, thanks for watching. Glad you're enjoying it and glad you're getting to play some music. John Hardy. Oh, wait, there was another. Oh, Ookpik. Somebody was asking for Ookpik. Chip. Ookpik. Great tune. That's actually, somebody was saying favorite Canadian tune, that is actually a Canadian tune. Um, and it's one of my favorites. All right, let's see here. What I missed in the chat. Start introducing sets of tunes in old time and bluegrass. Cool. Um... Oh, so yeah, somebody said, do you have any favorite sets? I think that was maybe you, James. Oh, yeah, any sets you play? Any old-time sets? I mostly just play single tunes when it comes to old-time bluegrass, but I, I love doing sets of Irish music. I'll do a little bit of that in a second here. Uh, 
favorite Canadian tune. Well, I could do a set of Canadian tunes. Um, yeah, I'll do a set of Canadian tunes. A uh, couple tunes from Quebec. Let's check, catch up on the chat here. Yeah, there's a bunch of versions of Oopik. Some people do it in A. I was doing it in G. Um... IT expert says newbie from Vancouver, Washington. Have an Ibanez very very basic mandolin. Not sure uh, why I have a lot of string buzz out of the G strings. Could be because I'm not pressing hard enough. Um, it could be it's really hard to uh, to kind of troubleshoot that without actually seeing the instrument. Um, I would take it to you know there's tons of music shops in Portland. I would take it um, take it to somebody there. Strum uh, down in Southeast is awesome. And uh, Parrot Dice Guitars over in Multnomah Village. There's tons of great places here that'll uh, take a look at it and do a good good job of um, getting you set up. You know, it could be it could be a technique thing. It could be that this, the G strings are too low at the nut. It could be that it's too low at the bridge. It could be that you have high fret somewhere. There's too many options to kind of troubleshoot over without actually seeing the instrument, but there's lots of good places in Portland and probably, I, I'm not sure in Vancouver specifically, but uh, there may be something up there. Let's see, quick question. How do you transpose guitar chords to mandolin chords? Or if you read the same chord, will the song sound weird because it's tuned to a different key? Yeah, so the mandolin is tuned different than a guitar, so you need different shapes. I've got some lessons on my website um, about kind of finding a bunch of bar chords like you would on the guitar that you can just move around the instrument. So, um, but you know, if you, if, if it says a G chord, it's going to be a different shape on a guitar and a mandolin. But if everybody's playing the G chord that is suited for their instrument, it's all going to sound great. I hope that helps answer your question. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for like kind of bar chords in general, chord shapes. Um, I've got a couple lessons in the technique and fundamental section of my website, mandolessons.com. Uh, cool, all time to the version of Upik. Oh, oh, I know who that guy is. Um, they learned it in Deer Isle, uh, which is right now where I used to live. Um, I didn't live it on Deer Isle, but oh, what's that guy's name? Oh, no. Uh, it'll come to me at some point, but I know that guy. Uh, he's great. And yeah, I think that I think Oopik is actually oh, it's, uh, I can't remember the I think it's a I think it's recently composed, not super recently, but um, by somebody in Canada. Oh, <laughs> uh, hey buddy, hey chord progression for hey buddy, hey. I'll do that after I play some tunes here. Um, working on a high fret on the ma octave mandolin today. If I get my garden watered, yep, lots of good. Still lots of projects, even with all the craziness in the world. There's Still not enough hours in the day. All right, so I'll, I'll play some tunes, just to, I'll play some Quebec tunes. I don't know what they will be or if they'll be on the website. I haven't played Quebec tunes in a while. Oh, here's a great set of tunes from one of my favorite, um, favorite Quebec groups, uh, La Tête de Violon, The Fiddleheads. Um, this is a set, they have two albums of mostly crooked tunes, so tunes that, you know, don't fit a normal kind of 32 bar contradance length tune, uh, structure. And they've got two albums of these crooked tunes and some books and stuff. And this is the first track, I'm not sure what the name of the, uh, uh, what the name of the tunes are. But the, it's the first track off their second CD. Um,
There's some Quebec tunes. That last one was not part of the set that I thought I was going to play. It's just a two-tune set off that CD. But then that last tune I thought would go away. Well, it wasn't my favorite transition, but uh, the last tune I also don't know the name of it. I actually, the, al- the album I know it from is Chris Wood and Andy Cutting, who are two great English musicians. Um, and they have it titled as Unknown, so I don't know what it's called. All right, let's see. Robert says, could be a, a heavier G string helps. Yep, um, that's definitely an opportunity. I think ultimately it's best if you can end up um, using, you know, whatever string gauges you, if you, if you really set on using a lighter set of strings for as a personal choice, there's ways to set up the instrument to not buzz. But in general, um, if you if you want to try some heavier strings, that could also help for sure. Especially on like octave mandolin. You said you've got an octave mandolin that, yeah, that, the the G strings on an octave mandolin often need to be quite heavy. Any exercises for improving how to hold the pick and keep the right hand closed? Um, you know, I think just kind of knowing, getting a sense of what that good right hand technique is going to be, of being nice and relaxed. You know, the pick does slip around in your hand a little bit. Just you know, spending time uh, doing tiny little readjustments as you play is going to help you kind of get more comfortable with the pick and um, make it so you don't have to clench down as hard. If you drop the pick, you know, during practice, that's totally fine. I think it's a good sign that you're not holding the pick too hard versus really clamping down, which will affect the sound you can get out of the instrument. Um, Let's see, red-haired boy, I can definitely do that. Slightly heavier game. Any tip on bit? Oh, I already read that one. you're playing with a group and playing open chords instead of chops, do you still play on the offbeat? Uh, you can. Often that offbeat is going to really sound nice with that really percussive chop. But um, there's no hard and fast rules if you're you know, already outside the realm of like traditional bluegrass where sort of the, the only role of the mandolin in terms of accompaniment is that offbeat chop for the most part. Um, if you're talking kind of really traditional bluegrass. But once you're outside of that, just experiment and see what sounds best. Talk a little bit about seventh chords and their function and how you might use them. Sure. So, you got a big G chord. You can make it, so a seven chord, what people mean when they say seven chord is they actually mean a dominant seven chord, which is often associated with blues. There's a couple different versions. You can have a major seven and a minor seven, which you'll find more in jazz. But when people say like a G7 chord, they're talking about a G dominant seven. And it, it sort of gives you that classic sort of bluesy sound. A little crunchy. that little bit of uh, tension into the sound and uh, it's got a couple different ro- roles depending on the kind of music you're playing if you're playing blues you can just play those you know like that blues lesson i put out regular uh, recently you can just play those dominant seven chords as a normal chord and it, it sounds good it adds a little crunch to the overall sound um another role that a seventh chord plays is it wants to kind of um lead the lead the chord progression to another chord. So if you're playing a G, then you play a G7, that really wants to pull you to a four chord, a C chord. G, G7, C. And that's sort of the voice leading in the that sort of natural chord progression of major chord to like you know the one major to the one dominant seven really pulls to the four major chord all right let's see seven chords i hope that's helpful glad you're back live are you going to regular weekly schedule uh not this is not the regular schedule at this point just because everything's kind of crazy right now i'm working on a bunch of different projects it's hard for me to do a regular schedule at this point but hopefully i can 
get back to it at some point here. But had a little bit of time, so I figured I'd I'd jump in and uh, hang out with you all for a little bit. Uh, Flop Your Mule, another great tune. Maybe I can play that into Red Haired Boy. Um, just starting out, more time with practicing scales or songs. Yeah, it's up to you. I, I don't love practicing scales. I don't find them particularly fun. Um, and, you know, especially if you're working with my website and you've got, you know, you're working on a bunch of, like, instrumental tunes. Um, those tunes, like all these tunes that I'm playing here, they're made up of scales, so you'll 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 end up working on scales by playing tunes. Um, scale uh, tunes are often just kind of collections of scales, scale patterns, and arpeggios, and then kind of like filling in with other little bits. And I find them a lot more fun to play than scales. That said, kind of having that basic understanding of what a scale sounds like, how to play it on the instrument, things like that, it's definitely helpful. Um, but in general, if you're having more fun playing songs and tunes, go that way. And if you find yourself really struggling with something that kind of points towards you needing to practice scales more, go back and, and work on some scales. All right, let's see. Did I miss anything here? No. Um, <coughs> excuse me. All right, another plus one for Flop Your Mule. Um. Cool. James says, attended the workshop with Sierra Hall. She suggested turning your pick into your palm to re reduce the click of the pick. So I think what you're maybe talking about there is taking that and you can kind of pull it in a little bit. I, I, I accomplished less pick click by, um, I've never talked to Sierra specifically about um, kind of pick technique, but um, I get rid of a lot of the pick click just by creating some angle between, you know, if the pick is flat to the floor or parallel to the floor, the neck of the instrument is at an angle, and that if you're looking down, it puts that left edge of the pick through the string first. So if it's flat too, you get a lot of pick noise. And, string noise. and then you can, if you tip the neck, it really rounds the tone. But um, it's hard to say exactly what Sierra was talking about without having been there myself, but I can see something like that. Midnight on the Water is a great tune. Unfortunately, it's copyrighted Benny Thomason. Um, but it's a great tune. I wish I could do it, and I wish I could put it on my website. Ch uh, how to chop to a fast bluegrass tune that drives. All right, I should do a little bit of catching up with requests. So I'll do a little bit of flop eared Mule into a little bit of Red Haired Boy, and then do a little bit of chopping, and then talk about that. So, here's a little floppy mule.
Flop-eared mule, little red-haired boy, and then some um, some chopping on red-haired boy. Um, so chopping fast, you know, I think the biggest thing is really just getting a nice uh, fluid motion in your right hand. Slow that down a little bit. You know, this is, it's so contextual kind of talking about um, accompaniment because you know, I'm the only one here. I was playing chords over a melody that didn't exist, and I was trying to hum it kind of unsuccessfully. Uh, so, But that just leaves a ton of space, so I was able to fill up that space with some kind of fancy chop stuff. You know, I think if there's a guitar and a bass and a fiddle and a banjo and a dobro, uh, you're going to bring that back and... Mm Whereas, uh, you know, if it's just me, I can really. I can get fancy and not kind of overrun what's going on around me. Um, but just I'll, I'll slow down that sort of uh, that fancied up chop. Uh, There's the chop, a little bass, 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 uh, bass, bass, chop, and bass, bass, up, up, bass, bass, chop, up, bass, bass, chop, up, bass, bass, chop, up. And that's just sort of, you know, that, that's taking the place of... So I hope that's helpful. Uh, can you play bluegrass, uh, blue, uh, bluegrass with a Neapolitan mandolin? Absolutely, yeah. It's a cool sound. Um, it's not super traditional, but people did it. You know, play play whatever kind of music you want on whatever instrument you have. That's my thoughts on the matter, anyway. All right, brother, how do you strum chords? Mine never sound like the song I'm trying to get it to sound like. Um, no problem. Sorry, total newbie here. That's totally fine. Um. No, no question is too simple. Um, you know, I think a lot of that will come with time as you get more uh, familiar with the instrument. You know, there's so many different ways you can get a chord, um, especially if you're, I think there's a couple ways that could make things sound different. If you're listening to mandolins and the chord's not sounding the same, it may be that they're using, you know, here's a G chord and here's a G chord. Oops, nope, here's a G chord. Here's a G chord. Here's a G chord. There's lots of chords all over the the neck, and sort of depending on which one it, it is, uh, can make it sound a little different than what you're playing. Likewise, with the the right hand, the strumming pattern. You know, if it's bluegrass and it's going that really percussive sound, that's going to be different from a more open sounding strum, and you know, I think it, it just takes time to kind of understand what it is you're listening to and figuring out how to match that sound on your instrument by picking the right chord shape with your left hand and figuring out the right strumming pattern with your right hand. Um, so just keep at it, and, you know, as you practice, you can't, you can't get any worse if you just keep going at it. It might be a somewhat slow process, but work on it a little bit, you know, even if it's just like five minutes a day, and soon enough you'll, you'll have a much better... Uh, hold on the instrument. All right, Lewis. Good to have you here. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, I heard it said if you practice scales and arpeggios, and you end up playing scales and arpeggios. Yep, that's kind of I've, I've said that in the past. And you know, there's definitely 
there's value. I don't want to knock scales and arpeggios because it's a good way to understand theory and understand kind of the the building blocks of what you're working with. But, you know, I think what AZ is talking about here is, you know, if you practice, especially when it comes to improvisation, you know, if, if you're always practicing scales outside of the context of a, a more musical melody like a fiddle tune, you're doing the same thing going up and down, up the scale and down the scale. And then your arpeggios are going to sound like this. So that when it comes time to take a solo, you know, you're going to... It says, take it. You go, okay. That's pretty much just scales and arpeggios, and that's fine. That's a great jumping off place. Um, but if you're practicing a tune, Somebody says, take a solo. Here we go. Here we go. It's got a little bit of scale in there. It's got a little bit of tune. You start getting used to kind of how you can alter scales rather than going, you're getting. scale patterns out of it and it'll be a little more musical and interesting in my opinion uh let's see ran across chris henry where it is 36 scale exercises cool i'd like to find that hair in the corn liz says working on hair in the corn you call it a slide in the lesson could you talk about the difference between slides jigs and reels absolutely we had a question earlier about slip jigs um and jigs so this is a good continuation so Reels, um, the, uh, the the way that Irish musicians learn it is um, reels go eggs and bacon, eggs and bacon, eggs and bacon, eggs and bacon, I can't say it, eggs and bacon, eggs and bacon, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So flop eared mule, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, that's not flop eared mule. So a good practice is anytime you hear a tune, try to figure out does it say eggs and bacon? Like, can you say eggs and bacon over it? Or if it's a jig, which are the two kind of most common tune types, at least in Irish music, are um, so jigs are rashers and sausages, rashers and sausages, rashers and sausages. Jiggity, 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 jiggity. Um, and so you can, that'll work over that six. So ra rashers and sausages, rashers and so It's a little six beat couplet going on. So that's a jig. And you've got so reels, eggs and bacon, eggs and bacon, uh, jigs, rashers and sausages, rashers and sausages. And a slide is kind of like, so slides are in 12 8. Um, so jigs are in 6-8, slip jigs are in 9-8, we talked about that a little earlier, so it's just a little kind of, it's like a jig and a half for measure. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, And then, uh, slides are in 12-8, and I think ultimately it's easiest to think about slides in terms of kind of like the rhythm rhythmic feel. They often have kind of a, a simplified melody that's really, um, it's got a lot of kind of momentum behind it. So. And so all these, I should say also, this is not the most succinct uh, explanation, but all of these are a reel is a, and a jig and a slide and a slip jig. These are all dances, um, especially in the Irish tradition. Um, you, you would dance to a slip jig and you would dance to a reel or a slide. And so you work, what it is is it's a tune that goes with a dance. Um, so, but in terms of the musicality of, of a, a slip, of a slide, whew, so many tune types. 
It's kind of got this these short little phrases. You know, it's not like kind of where you tap your foot really makes you want to like. Think of them in my brain a little bit. I don't know if it like doesn't really translate to language. It's a little bit kind of like the polka version. Like a polka is to a reel as a slide is to a jig. You know, polkas you have like very bah, 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 very swingy. Uh, Really kind of groovy, heavy, heavy, heavy footed sound. Hope that's helpful. Um, Kitty's Wedding, I love that tune, and I can't remember how it goes. Uh, what did Chuck Berry say about the beauty of the melody? I don't know. Please enlighten us. Unless it's a joke, in which in which case tell us the punchline. Um, Cliff says, how do I find the best notes for double stops to add some sound to the single notes on a tune like Flop Eared Mule or the Cliffs of Moore? So this is a whole big subject. I've got uh, a, a four-part series in the techniques and fundamentals section on my website on double stops. It's kind of close to the bottom of the page. Uh, in general, um, the, the place to start is just with open strings. So Flop Eared Mule, key of D, at least for the first part. Um, so in the key of D, your really safe drone notes are a D and an A, which is the fifth. And both of those you can kind of play. So you can play the D, A, D and A string the whole time you're playing floppy or mule. And you'll end up with either like two or three strings moving at any given time. So that, that's kind of a good way to get some drones in there. And that's a good jumping off place for for double stops. And then, you know, if you say, okay, but I really want a specific note, you can think about, okay, what notes are in a D chord? Um, your first two notes of a of flop eared mule, actually first three are kind of a D arpeggio. Kind of the first four kind of the major structure. Um, so those are kind of all double stopping each other. So F sharp on the E string, a nice double stop under that is the fifth fret of the A string, which is a D, so D and F sharp. And then you say, okay, well, now I've got my next note is that D. What can I add under that as a double stop? How about this A, seventh fret on the D string? So we have five, five and two. And then on the D and A string, seven and five. And then your open A string is your melody note. And you say, okay, put an F sharp below that. Fourth fret on the D string. You get. But often, you know, kind of work picking out those individual little double stops. It's a, It kind of creates enough flying fingers on your left hand that it can take away from some of the uh, the kind of fluidity of the tune. It's more of, you'll hear that stuff with kind of more closed double stop shapes and bluegrass, and it's a great sound. Um, you know, if I really want to get the mandolin making a lot of sound, I'll usually just stick to open strings, because then they can ring out while I, I play the melody around them. 
All right, let's see. All right, almost 60 people here. Welcome, everyone. Any advice for your right hand when playing double stops? Yeah, um, so this is a good follow-up question. You know, when we first pick up the instrument, we spend so much time focusing on hitting the right string at the right time with our right hand. Um, but, you know, it's like, oh, I'm playing on this, on the D string. And then sometimes maybe our, our right hand will get confused and we'll hit the A string while trying to play on the D string. And it doesn't really work. So we're really become very, it becomes very important to play a single string um, at a, any given time. And in order to get your right hand to kind of think about double stops, you need to break that rule a little bit. So you need to, I think of it as kind of widening out my pick stroke. You can have one string, or you can have two sets of strings, D and A, or three sets of strings, and we can do a chord here, two open open, or three sets, four, four sets of strings. You got a full chord. You back off to D, uh, G, D, and A, two open open. Then back off again, just D and A. Just D. So you're kind of teaching your hand, your right hand, how to move a little bit more and grab another string at any given time. Um, so you get multiple courses of strings moving at once. It takes a little bit of time, but you know, just think of, just work on it a little bit whenever you can, and you'll you'll, you'll get you'll get the hang of it. Cool, Vicky just learned uh, "Drowsy Maggie." It's a great tune. I can't remember how it goes right now. Uh, cool, T. White says I got an A style Gibson that was my grandfather's, and he bought it in the twenties. Um, Want to know if it's better to restore it or keep it as is? Ah, oh, does it? I mean, does it play? If it like a lot of those instruments just hold up fine and they're good to go, sometimes they need a lot of work. Um, I would take it to a, a well respect. I would go to the Mandolin Cafe, a great online resource for mandolin. Um, sign up, for, sign up for an account at the, in the forum. Post a picture of it, you know, in there. Tell people where you are and say, hey, is this thing worth like repairing? It often probably is. You know, if it's a Gibson from the twenties. Um, those are beautiful mandolins, um, and it probably is worth restoring. You know, it can be expensive depending on the amount of work and where you take it. Um, but you know, tell people where you are, post any pictures that might describe the condition it's in, and people will be able to say, "Oh, you're close to such and such shop, which is a great place to get an instrument fixed." You know, here's what it might cost, and then you can start that process. But in general, you know. If it, it it may play fine, and you might not really need to like quote unquote restore it. Um, you know you don't you don't you, unless it's like you don't need often people will want to like refinish things to make them shiny. You don't need to do that. Um, it's more just kind of keeping it playable. Um, it's worth making it play. If it's playable, great. It probably doesn't need anything. If it um, if it doesn't play or if it plays really hard, it might be worth taking it somewhere. Maiden's Prayer. I can never remember how that one goes. Uh, what do you think the best way to keep learning mandolin after finishing the beginning series and learning some of the beginner fiddle tunes? That's a great question. I get that question all the time. Um, you know, beginner series, totally the, the place to start. Even if you're not a beginner necessarily. Like, I, I've i learned, I think, a lot of what I know just from focusing on the basics and going back and thinking about technique and tone production and all those really basic things. So even if you've been playing mandolin for a while and then you stumble across my site, check out the mandolin, uh, the, the beginner series, see if you learn something about technique. It'll, it'll probably be a lot of repeat information, but you can breeze through it pretty quick. You know, spend the, the hour that it takes to go through the beginner series. And then if, if you don't learn anything, you're good to go. If you do, then maybe you have some technique to work on or tone production skills, things like that. And then after that, I really recommend people just kind of let their ears guide them. You know, if, you, if you're really drawn to um, Irish music, like if there's a particular kind of tune, you can sort through my website by genre. You can sort through by um, difficulty level. You can sort through by key. 
and you know, ultimately find a tune that you like the sound of and try to learn it. It might be, you know, I, I have them listed in like beginner, intermediate, advanced um, categories, but there's a lot of crossover there. Really, you know, uh, an intermediate Irish tune might be hard, like quote unquote harder than an old time tune that's in the advanced category if you've been playing Irish music all your life and you don't know much about old time music. So, you know, mostly just listen, let your ears guide you, listen to a lot of music outside of my website, see what draws you, draws you in, and, you know, try to learn more about whatever it is, you know, what, what made you pick up the instrument, and what can you imagine yourself being really excited to be able to play? If it's bluegrass, work on bluegrass. If it's classical music, work on classical music. If it's fiddle tunes, that's mostly what my site is kind of focused on, and you can search through the tunes, get a sense of, like, what makes an Irish tune an Irish tune? What makes an old time tune an old time tune? Start learning the ones that uh, sound good to you. Cool. Col Colby's working through the beginner series too. Glad you're enjoying the website. Awesome. And the the Heathen Diaries uh, says just learned Irish Washerwoman. It's a great tune. Silver Spear. Oh, I might be able to. Silver Spear. Uh, uh, is this it? Spear, but I, I, I have trouble with that one sometimes. Hello from Russia, Ian. Thanks for joining. Could you show how the hand should move while playing the jig? Yes. And there's also a lesson on my website in the technique and fundamentals section on uh, the right hand picking pattern for jigs. So the general pattern, let's just use the open D string, is going to be, so like we were talking about earlier, jigs are 6-8, so there are two little collections of three, and it's going to be that, that the one sec one chunk of three is three pick strokes, which is down, up, down. And then the next one is the same thing, down, up, down. So you put those together, and you get down, up, down, 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 down. So you have to kind of double down at times. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Down, up, down, down, up, down. Down, up, down, down, up, down, down. pattern down up down down up down um, and there's a lesson over on the website that's a little more in detail do you ever use a capo or other tunings i love using a capo and other tunings <laughs> um i've got a lesson on my website called alternate tunings i think it's in the technique and fundamentals section that's called uh little language space out there 
Yeah, technique and fundamentals. Um, yeah, there's lots of good ones. You can do, go to like kind of a cross A equivalent, which I don't usually bring the G and D strings up to A and E. I bring the A and E strings down to G, so it'd be like cross G, G, D, G, D, and then capo on the second fret, and you get cross A. You can do uh, the calico equivalent, which would be G, D, G, B, and then capo on the second fret, and you get A, E, A, C sharp. That's a great sound. Um, you can check out the, I go through like a whole, uh, probably a dozen um, in that video. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a different sound. It's, it's not really like the bluegrass sound. Although Bill Monroe had some wild tunings. He had tunings where he split strings. So you, you know, like you would tune one of his E strings down to a C sharp and leave the other one. You get a really wacky sound. It's very cool. Um, so yeah, experiment with it. It's great to capo and then the capo, you know, it's not super useful for that kind of percussive bluegrass chop sound. But if you want to get, you know, like, you know, like this kind of really droney A sound. You can. Put a capo on. This is a wildly oversized capo. I don't even know if it's going to work, but now I want to do that in... C sharp. Put it on the. Yeah, it works. Now, if you want to do that in C sharp and get all those open strings ringing, you can't really do it unless you have open strings to play. Capo on the fourth fret, playing out of the key of A. get it in C sharp. Great for playing with singers in often like an Irish style or, or folk setting. Where do you find the, the sheet music for mandolin or some arrangement of classical fiddle or cello tunes? Um, I would look, there's, there's a couple books, I'm not familiar with the names. I would ask that question over on the Mandolin Cafe forum. Um, there's a whole classical music section People will totally be able to point you in the right direction, but I'm not super familiar with. I know that there are um, kind of mandolin transcriptions of like the Bach cello suites. I think there's a, a print book out that has that, but um, I would ask that over at Mandolin Cafe or maybe somebody here in the chat knows. All right, I'm going to finish up with these last couple questions and then call it a day. I got to get on with my day and eat some lunch. But uh, let's see, I'll burn through these last couple questions here. Whoa, there's a lot more than I thought. Um, advice on how to simplify a melody while ornamenting and speeding it up. You know, I think take that as two separate things. Take a tune, see what you can take away from it in order to simplify it. Um, you know, like, uh, Fisher's Hornpipe is a very noty tune. So it's like, okay, what can I take out of that tune and still make it sound like Fisher's Hornpipe? And then say, okay, now I've got some space. Now it's time to fill it in. That's a great way to work on some kind of ornamentation and melodic variation while really maintaining the, the, the fundamentals of any given tune. Awesome. Karen from Ireland, good to have you here. Tips on backing up weird stuff in tra Irish traditional music. Fine backing up major, not too bad on minor. Struggling with those that come up from time to time, Mixolydian, Dorian playing G dad on a bazooki. Very cool. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tricky. I don't know if I can totally like, it's, it's very contextual. I think something to keep in mind, I think it ultimately, you gotta like hear somebody that, you know, it's, it's a weird thing because Irish traditional music is 
like traditionally an unaccompanied music. So when you have all these tunes that are like mixed in or sometimes they'll have like C's and C sharp, you take a tune like the old Bush. It's got like C natural, C sharps, F natural, F sharps, all kind of right next to each other. It's like, what am I supposed to play for chords? I think it really takes, um, you know, listening to someone who's got an arrangement. And ultimately, there's there's multiple options at any given time. There's sort of, um, there's more traditional and less traditional ways to do it. You know, you listen to somebody like Alec Finn, amazing bazooki player, and he's pretty straight ahead in terms of like what I think of as um, Irish. He's got some wild technique and does some really cool stuff. Um, but it sounds very Irish just because he's, he was doing it for so long. And um, well, he was Irish. <laughs> uh, and then you, you, you listen to someone like Gray Larson who has a, a very different sense of harmony. He doesn't play bazooki, but um, you know, he'll, he'll put some really interesting chords that are less traditional um sounding to sort of a traditional Irish musician's ears, but are still very cool. Uh, so, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's, I don't have like exact, an exact answer for you, but hopefully that helps. You know, it's very contextual. You got to learn kind of like what the thing to do is listen to other Irish traditional music uh, accompanists and see, see what you learn. Ooh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through all these because they're coming in quicker than I can read them. Let's see. Uh, Adam Steffi is very good. Check out Magnus Zetterland. He's awesome. I was just on his Mandolin Secrets uh, workshop. Those are super fun. Um, show us the favorite mandolin you own. It's this one right here. It is an Ellis made by Tom Ellis in Austin, Texas. Built in 2009. And that's the year I bought it in. And I love it. The only other mandolin I have, really, um, is I have an old Gibson oval hole. From, it's an A, Gibson A. It's between the Junior and the A1 from 1924 that I also love. But this is, this is the one for me. Looking for mandolin tunes, this sort of modal sound, like Appalachian banjo tunes, like Darlin' Corey. So look up... Um, any uh, suggestions for rec records or online tabs? So you're looking for old-time modal tunes. Um, I would ask over in the Mandolin Cafe. You'll get a ton of suggestions. You can search on my website by key and just kind of look at all the modal sections. A lot of them will be Irish, but there are some great um, modal old-time tunes. And there's, you know, I do all my normal lesson things with those. Peak Fiddlers, Silver Spire on YouTube. Yeah, Silver Spire is also a great tune. I always get it mixed up with Silver Spear. Um, all right, let's see. Do you play any other mandolin family instruments like mandola, octave mandolin, mandocello, etc.? I do. Um, I love all mandolin family instruments. I'll show you a little sneak peek of what I've been working on lately. Not exactly mandolin, um, ooh, not in tune. That's not the right pick for it. So this is a, this is actually a plectrum guitar. Um, so it's only four strings, but I've got it tuned almost like a mandocello. Mandocello would be C, G, D, A. And this is just one fret, one or two frets or one step higher, D, A, E, B. Except right now I've actually got a D A E A, so kind of bazooki tuning. So it's like a baritone bazooki or something. Kind of a fun sound. Um, yeah, and I also play mandola and octave mandolin and tenor guitar tuned GDAE and GDAD, bazooki. I love them all. Four fingers, four strings. That's the way I like to uh, think about it. Yeah, I hope people are sitting around with mandolins in hand while these are going on. Lonesome Moonlight Waltz. I can never remember how that one goes, unfortunately. I apologize. 
All right, I'm gonna head out. Looks like people are also getting ready to head. Uh, point for the armrest. Last couple questions here. Um, it's not a necessity by any means. I uh, just kind of, I've gotten used to it. I feel like it's a little more comfortable on my arm. It puts my hand in a nice position, but uh, it does. It can protect the finish. It can also beat up the. Finish. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this, but I've totally chewed chewed up the finish on the mandolin from, you know, like tightening it down and stuff. It'll protect the finish in some ways and <laughs> potentially harm it in others. I've never tried to play an oud. I would love to. Uh, mando casters are very fun. Uh, I, I've been getting into mandolin, uh, uh, electric instruments, things like that. Uh, I have used the Gibson for some lessons. I can't remember which one's off the top of my head. Um, but if you search back, I think you can... Ah, that's a good question. I've done. A, I've played the Gibson a lot on some of these past live streams. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you all so much. Got to head out. Thanks for sticking around for the hour. Hope you're all doing well, staying safe, and I hope you... Um, yeah. Hope you're getting time to play lots of music, and I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.